Hello. So I wanted to give a brief addendum to the sectioning process because I've realized that in order to preserve more brain tissue, we may want to change exactly how many series we section is. So a brief revisitation to what I had described in another video, the vibratome sectioning video. In that video, I su suggested using uh, four series of sections. So let's say that we've mounted the forebrain here, uh, depicted in the lower left, onto a vibratome chuck. And if we want to section in four series, we basically do so like this. So you'll notice that we just restarted after we've gone through four consecutive slices. So each series has it such that there is sort of an equal space from the first section that you put in uh, well 1A here, or front, uh, and then the next section that you put in later. So the fifth section and the first section are going to be equidistant from each other. The second section and the sixth section that go into B here are gonna be equidistant from each other and so on and so forth. So this was all well and good. Um, I also showed in my video what happens when we have both the hind brain and the forebrain or front versus back, let's say, on the vibratome chuck together with each other. And these are just hemispheres rather than uh, both hemispheres attached, so hemisected brains. So if we were to attach both of them, we could cut down, no pun intended, our sectioning time to half of what it would normally be. And so it would basically be the same principle. It's just that we would separate out sections from the forebrain into their own column of wells here, and then sections of the hindbrain into their different column of wells. So in this case, we don't really have the front and back sections mingling in the same well. Uh, well 1A only has series one front sections. Well 2A only has uh, the first series of back sections. So in this regard, it does kind of help us in if we only want to use the forebrain for some sort of staining procedure, then we could just select things out of, let's say, 1A. and then get all those sections together. The problem I saw is that we end up actually having too many sections even with this approach, I would argue. And rather than expand the amount of storage that would be required by having all the front sections separated into even more wells and all the back sections separated into even more wells, I suggest the following alternative. So, Let's say that, again, we mount the forebrain and the hindbrain together side by side on the same vibratome chuck so that the blade cuts across both of them at the same time. So they'll get sectioned simultaneously. The difference is that they'll go into the same well, but we will still use a total of eight wells. So as we do with the following. Here, both the forebrain and the hindbrain sections end up going into the same well as long as they come from the same slice. And we keep going into the next column. So we don't segregate them into different columns. We just have them grouped together with every single slice. In this way, we end up having eight full series. So 1A ends up having all forebrain and hindbrain sections of that series. Same as 2A will have all hindbrain and forebrain sections of its respective series. So we don't have to worry about separating them out. And this also assumes that you're gonna to want to take snapshots or representative sections of the entire brain 
as you are taking up one whole series. So this way you don't have to pick through what's in a well to find the sections you want. You're basically going to take all the sections in this well and use them for a round of staining and still have seven other series that you can select and go through. So what caused me to select eight series rather than four? Some of it I've already mentioned, but let's kind of get this down into some numbers here. Admittedly, I chose this a little bit arbitrarily, but uh, some of it has to do with the fact that it doesn't really change the storage requirements for how many wells we're going to use or how many plates we're going to use per subject brain. So let's say that we're sectioning at 50 micrometer thickness per, per slice, per brain slice. And this can be adjusted, granted. Some people prefer much thinner sections than this. If you're working with uh, students, it's definitely a lot easier for them to manage 50 micrometer sections. And this is not a knock to students. I mean, if the sections are not so well fixed, doing something less than 50 micrometers can be very uh, irritating for the students, to say the least. So what I opt for is sectioning at 50 micrometer thickness. And so if we're doing this eight series approach, and we're looking at that well number 1A, for instance, uh, of the previous slide, then the distance between the first section and the next one of the four brain alone, let's say, uh, will be about 450 micrometers. So it's eight series times 50 micrometers per section. And then we add another 50 because we've started a new uh, round. So the ninth section uh, or something like that. So if we're just looking at the four brain alone, just sort of pan this back real quick. If we're looking at just the four brain alone in this case, then we're going to have uh, the first section that we section from the four brain go into 1A. And we'll do all the rest of the series sectioning. And then when we take our ninth cut, we then start the cycle over. So section four brain section number nine will go back to 1A. And then 10th section will go to 1B. Uh, 11 section, 1C, and so on and so forth. So the distance between sections, four brain sections, one and nine, ends up being roughly 450 micrometers. So that sounds like it's kind of a big jump, but it's not too bad. So follow along. Uh, we're using the Paxinos and Watson Atlas. Certainly other people can use the Swanson Atlas. Uh, there are good reasons to use either one or even both if you have the time. What I've noticed is that if we're using Paxinos, uh, there is roughly 120 micrometers between each page. Now this does vary between some pages. It does jump up in some cases, jump down in others, but we're gonna say that it's roughly 120 micrometers. It tends to be consistent with a lot of pages. If we are looking across four pages, then this jumps up to being 480. So four times 120 gives us 480. All right. When we compare the number we have before, 450 micrometers between slice one and slice nine of the four brain that go into the same well, that is not too different from the 480 that goes across four pages. What does this mean? Well, we can assume that each section in a series represents every fourth atlas page or a different way of thinking about it, a quarter of all the atlas pages. For, so for the first part, the distance between section one and section nine of the four brain, both put into well 1A, will be like skipping from atlas page, let's say one to atlas page four. And the next one would be something like atlas page seven or eight. Um, as for the idea of quarter of all atlas pages, this has to do with section management as well. And this is another reason why I opted for the eight series approach. So if we're looking at Paxinos, I know I don't have this number exact, but it's around this number. There are about 140 coronal atlas pages. So this translates to about 35 sections total per series when we take eight series. So let's break this down a little bit. If we were to take one section that represents each atlas page, that would give us 140 sections in a given series, regardless of how thick they would be, assuming they wouldn't be super thick. And so that's a lot. Um, imagine staining 
managing and having to mount and then analyze 140 sections per subject. That is extremely cumbersome, extremely time consuming. And really, even though some people would be like, well, okay, we're getting a lot of data out of this. How much data are you really getting that's meaningful? Getting data for the sake of data is not always helpful, especially when it ends up slowing down your research pipeline. So there are some cases where there are some brain areas that you could accidentally skip that are very tiny. But for the most part, if you're looking at a whole brain kind of approach, a whole brain staining and analysis, you don't want to have more data to manage and more data to store, especially if it doesn't create a leap forward in the actual conclusions you can derive from that data. So the idea of having 140 sections is just kind of insane to me. <laughs> Like I said, there are reasons for why you might do that, but I don't think that in a lot of cases, starting out taking 140 sections per even series, let's say, is even reasonable. So if we were to do the eight series approach, where they're being sectioned at 50 micrometers, this ends up whittling down the total amount of sections that we have per series to 35, which is far more manageable. So that way we get representative snapshots of the brain as we skip across a few atlas pages at a time uh, from one to the next to the next each section. We only have 35 sections to deal with and the brain is not changing thankfully that dramatically from section one to section nine. And even this number is kind of a highball. Um, if you had the full olfactory bulb intact and attached to the brain, and if the brain stem was not partially lost during brain extraction, in other words, uh, brain extraction, sometimes we cut it short by accident. If you had everything, then you would still be using about the full 140 plus Atlas pages. But chances are you won't be. Chances are it's actually going to be less than this. You might start uh, with sections on like Atlas page six, for instance. And then the amount of sections that you derive might stop right at the back of the cerebellum. Um, and for those who are hindbrain enthusiasts, sorry for even mentioning that we're losing part of the brainstem, but sometimes it does work out that way, uh, much to uh, our dislike. So if we're working with less, then the total amount of sections we end up working with ends up being less too, probably closer to 30. Definitely manageable per subject. So if we did four series, like I originally had in my Vibratome video, that would actually multiply the amount of sections we'd have per series to 70, if my math checks out. And 70 sections, doubling it, that's a lot to sift through. That's a lot to sort through and analyze, especially if you do not know by default which brain regions you're going to want to look at. It's a lot of brain tissue to look over with your microscope. So this is part of the reason too, why I opted for something like 35. Um, so this is also assuming that when you collect 35 sections in a given series, that you will stain all of them at the same time and that you will analyze all of them at the same time. And I really do recommend that if you're doing the series sectioning and collecting series that you stain all the sections of the series in an equal way. Now, this sucks if the staining for some reason doesn't work. That happens sometimes. Uh, you can ask me troubleshooting tips or look on ResearchGate online uh, if that does happen. But the thing about sectioning and staining is that you want to treat all the sections equally so there isn't variability in staining, especially if there are certain markers like uh, CFOS, Delta FOS B, other things that we're trying to count that the staining efficacy might change the numbers on. We want to avoid that as much as possible. So there are still some caveats to this approach. Um, some people are concerned about the skipping pages thing. So if we skip from page one to four or five, uh, that we're going to miss data. We're going to miss brain regions that are important. If you know off the bat which brain regions are going to be important, then you should kind of take smaller sections for those brain areas. Aside from that, though, most of the time, brain areas are large enough that we're not missing a huge swath of what's going on there. And also, if you're trying to look for more fine grain stuff, then you just end up staining two series simultaneously. So you take series from well one, and then series from well two, and then you stain both. 
So really this gives you a little bit more flexibility if anything. And I think that this caveat is really super situation, situationally dependent on what your needs are. Now, there is another caveat I mentioned in my other video um, that I'm gonna mention here. If you're doing free floating immunohistochemistry, uh, the stain is able to penetrate from both surfaces of the tissue. And so this means that the maximum stain penetration usually goes 40 microns deep. And so if you have sections that are 50 microns, like what we have, in theory, it doesn't penetrate all the way down to the inner 10 microns or maybe even a little bit more than that. So that could be problematic. Um, if you're using a detergent in order to aid penetration, like Triton in uh, small amounts, that does tend to help a decent a bit. But generally the penetration issue kind of is like you aim for 40 and assume that the innermost 10 is not going to be stained if it's 50 micrometers. Um, now, if you're trying to image it under a microscope, even with epifluorescence, trying to get the deeper layers into view at low magnification, where we have a depth of field that is appropriate for like 40 or 50 micrometers, getting the deeper layers to show up might be tricky if you don't use a cover slipping agent that is clearing in nature. Mineral oil for me works. The problem is that it does not self dry. Uh, for immunofluorescence stuff, I use uh, a homemade polyvinyl alcohol mounting medium. That works okay because it does dry. For it to clear the tissue, it has to completely dry within the slide as well. So I recommend using some sort of cheapo desiccation setup. Could even use dry right in a box or something. Um, as I've mentioned, 50 micrometers though is a little easier to work with. Uh, we've had problems where when we try to go down to 40, the vibratome will have some uneven sectioning where we'll get alternating thick and thin sections. It might be missing part of the tissue. Again, see vibratome video I have separately for some examples of what that might look like. This might be like just trying to tune up the vibratome type issue. It might not apply to you. So you don't necessarily have to follow exactly 50. You could do fewer, uh, uh, sorry, thinner sections like 40 micrometers if that's really what your lab needs to do. Another thing to consider, if you don't do free-floating IHC, if you stick your IHC sections to slides first before staining them with immunohistochemistry or other types of stains, penetration is basically halved. So it's only able to penetrate from the exposed surface of the section and the other surface that's stuck on the slide, it's obviously not able to get to. So it only penetrates about 15 to 20 micrometers deep. If you don't care about the other depth, that's fine. Um, if you need to have sections this thin, I really suggest not using a vibratome in the first place. A cryostat would be better for trying to collect sections, even if it's the whole brain, it's very time consuming. A cryostat is definitely better for thinner sections. Uh, trying to do this with a vibratome, even with decently fixed brain tissue, 20 micrometer or even 15 micrometer thick tissue is very problematic to work with. Even if you're experienced with working with sections that are fixed and floating around in solution, it's, it's super obnoxious trying to do that with just fibrotone. With cryostat, all you'd have to do is section this really thin section, then take a warm slide and then just touch it to the section and it slaps itself right on as it melts and dries instantly to the slide. So that's why cryostat would be better for that. Um, all that aside, that's all I had to say for now. If you have follow-up questions, just let me know. But that is why I'm gonna try switching to this eight series approach. Thank you.